by the drink. This is going to be a big boost to the tourism industry. Uh, National Songwriters Association formed. In a week, they're going to have their Hall of Fame uh, awards. First CMA award show, which is kind of, uh, well, I don't know, coming up uh, soon. That's uh, that's uh, that's held in 1967. Uh, 1969, we have TV coming in. The Johnny Cash Show, Hee Haw. Uh, the Gun Family Show, which is actually done in, um, in, in L.A., but a lot of country talent there. Uh, and the CMA Award Show, which is televised for the first time live. The first time it wasn't televised at all. Second time, uh, they uh, taped it, but then they didn't, um, uh, they delayed the broadcast, and then it wasn't until 69 uh, 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 that they showed it live. Uh, in 69, National Center for Recordings by Southern Gospel Groups. Country Radio Seminar first held, Opryland opens, Fanfare happens, all of this is happening in the 60s and 70s. Um, the 1973 Grammy Awards, and I can pause after this if anybody has questions, so. Uh, this is an interesting story. Um, at Grammy start in LA, uh, by some folks out there, a guy named James Conk. And um, they bring in New York uh, on the second year pretty quickly. And uh, by the time we get to 1964, they need Nashville. And Nashville's not terribly interested. Uh, not many members. So they, uh, they come in. And part of the deal was that they would rotate uh, where the Grammys were, tele uh, were well, they weren't televised at the time, were held. And they had, New York, they had uh, LA and New York, and then they had Nashville. Then it landed in Nashville in 1963. And it was a huge backlash from the pop and rock community. Um, NBC and uh, ABC refused to televise it. They didn't have, uh, they didn't want anything to do with it. It fell in CBS's lap. Uh, they, you know, they begged them to take it. Well, the ratings went through the roof, and that gave the Grammy Awards to CBS from then on. <laughs> that showed them. Uh, <clears throat> That, uh, that same period of time, they were trying to tear down the Ryman. Said it was a, an abundance of crime area. Real estate executives said if the Ryman is left standing in its present uh, condition, it would be damaging to any effort to develop, redevelop the area. So a lot of uh, backlash against uh, against that, and citizens kind of rallied around, and they kept it, and then they tried to tear it down again, and they kept it, and of course now it is the premier, voted the premier listening spot in that, and for that uh, number of people uh, in the country. Um, I'll pause for a moment. Does anybody have any questions? I can talk for nine hours. <laughs> yes? Um, why do you think it took Dylan to convince like rock and roll artists to come down and record when Elvis was recording like 10 years ago? <sighs> it was a different generation. Elvis, uh, Elvis was in that first wave of rock and roll. The music of the 60s was kind of the second wave of rock and roll. And Dylan was a real tastemaker. Um, and so that just kind of gave it the okay amongst that uh, pop and rock crowd. Elvis really came out of the South. Dylan didn't. Uh, Elvis was, you know, a Southern guy, so it was logical that it would be done in after. And in fact, he doesn't record regularly here until after he gets out of the Army in 1960. So, uh, and he records most of those soundtrack albums in LA. Um, so, but anyway, Dylan was Dylan was important. More questions? Yes. How would you say the whole outlaw country movement sort of fit into the whole Nashville sound? It's a funny thing you brought that up. Well, no, it's. Uh, <laughs> Paul McCartney comes to Nashville in '74. He records several uh, songs here. Stays here six weeks. Um, uh, the uh, uh, Opry moves from the Rhyme to the Opry House. The film Nashville premieres, which is a big deal, uh, because it does not present Nashville like it wanted to see itself. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that, uh, seen that movie. And the outlaw movement. And what that does, it basically ends the Nashville sound, because uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll uh, get into country music through the outlaw movement in the uh, in the mid 70s. Uh, it's a heavier beat. Uh, uh, it's, it's it's the long hair guys. It's uh, uh, 
uh, again, the contemporary 60s culture, what we think of as the 60s culture, really blossoms in Nashville 10 years later with the outlaw movement. And that's going to reach young people. Uh, that's, that's a time that country music, country music's demographics was uh, pretty much 35 plus, and it still, still basically is, but it reaches a lot more young people than it used to. This is the first time it's reaching young people consistently because it fits the image that they want to have. Uh, if you're familiar with cont uh, contemporary Christian music, uh, Bill Gaither records here. Uh, still does. Uh, he's got a studio up in uh, Indiana, too. But uh, uh, this it was a million-selling uh, uh, album, uh, Alleluia, Praise Gathering uh, for Believers. That was cut mostly here. Amy Grant releases her first album in 1977. Uh, Belmont Church on Music Row uh, is uh, a, a, a real center for a lot of these key Christian artists like Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant go to that church. Uh, there's a little coffee house next to it. Still, it's still there. It's not going to run as a coffee house anymore. Belmont Church is still having services. Uh, and so that's uh, the growth of contemporary Christian music in Nashville. Um, and it's going to consolidate even further. 1982, the American General purchases life, uh, National Life in Action. It's a hostile takeover. This is the era of the takeovers. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, National Life and Accident owns WSM, AMF, and the Ryman Opry, Opryland. American General could care less about it, so they just sort of uh, 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 fluff it off and Gaylord Broadcasting buys, that, buys it after that. Uh, CMT is going to go on the air and TNN will go on the air. This is going to bring, uh, make Nashville a TV center for country music. Uh, Ralph Emery, the National Network show. Uh, the National Network has been changed to Spike TV. Um, and kind of dies off. The guy who uh, inherits Gaylord doesn't really care much for country, so. Um, 90s explosion in country music sales. Uh, sound scan, of that barcode technology comes in, and so you no longer have biased recordings. When the little beeper goes off, the clicker goes off, it says you sold an album. And uh, it didn't matter what, if it, if it was a, a guy standing on one leg and yodeling, that was as good as full production. So uh, uh, that, and Walmart expands beginning in 1985, and we have the era of Garth uh, coming out, of, and, and Garth comes along at the right time. Um, Christian music industry in the 90s, Word Records comes to Nashville, Sparrow Records comes to Nashville, that's bought by EMI. Um, Benson Group is bought, uh, Gaylord buys Word, and of course down here, um, where do I have it? Uh, Mike Kerr buys a Word Records out of all of that. Um, Kerr Records moves from LA to Nashville in 92, uh, becomes the largest independently owned record company in country music. Uh, and, and Sony Tree is going to expand. MCA Warner Brothers, new offices here. This is a pretty established place by then. Uh, BMI moves its back offices. Oh, you know, the, the royalties calculated in uh, uh, South Africa are done here in Nashville, uh, BMI royalties are. Uh, Maddox family donates uh, RCA Studio B to the Hall of Fame. And this is key to saving the Ryman. Emily Harris records an album called At the Ryman. Uh, it's a big success, brings attention to the Ryman, and uh, uh, the Gaylord folks decide, hey, we'll, we'll fix it up now. And they did uh, in uh, over 94. And then we have the sale of TNN and CMT to Western uh, House Broadcasting, and that ends up uh, falling through. Uh, I say falling through, cut, being cut out. Opryland closes, uh, CBS cancels the country music shows. Nashville 1999, well you can see what we've got. 90 record companies, 300 music publishers. Um, Two billion dollar industry. In the 2000s, we had that film, Old Brother, Where Art That, which used a lot of Nashville talent and old country songs. Americana uh, Association comes along, 9-11, uh, uh, Where Were You When the World Stops Turning, which was the song that kind of captures that whole, uh, that whole event. Uh, Curb Foundation uh, is going to buy RCA Studio B, and uh, we get to use it for a while. Uh, International Bluegrass Association moves from Ellenberg, Kentucky. The Mike Kerr College of Entertainment and Music Industry is established in Belmont, 2003. Fist Jubilee Singers record an album here at the uh, Ocean Lake. Uh, Fanfare renamed CMA Festival. Uh, American Idol, Carrie Underwood, who doesn't want to be a pop star, she wants to be a country star. 
the uh, American Idol people don't, you know, want her to be a pop star. Well, she gets her way. And here's some other things that have happened. Big Machine uh, Records is formed. Jack White moves here. Uh, Mike Kerr really advised a lot of Music Row and saves it. Um, the building where I'm in, 34 Music Square, the next door to that, studios. Skirmer Horn opens. Um, and the 40th Annual CMA Awards, ABC finally gets back. From 1973, they were iced out. Barbershop Harmony Society, uh, Blake uh, uh, Shelton is on The Voice. And uh, here's where we have with that preservation problem. Between 2005 and 2010, over 30 buildings in Music Road area were demolished. You just have to drive down Music Road to see, see the cranes. In fact, you can't even get through the road sometimes. Um, we were declared a national treasure in, in 2015. Uh, CSAC and CMI moved to the building on Music Road right across the street from me. Blocked my view. Um, Mike Kerr purchases word records. The Nashville TV show debuts. And RCA office building and studio A were saved. And uh, that's all I have.